I didn't see a countdown. Well, shalom. I may have missed the countdown because it was below me. At any rate, I felt it necessary to record this message as a live video, which I will put up on my Facebook after it is done. And the reason I want to record this is this is an expansion of an article which I posted last April concerning the mark of the beast. And because of recent posts among my Facebook family and articles and teachings recently posted, responses to COVID-19 pandemic, I call it the COVID-1984 after George Orwell's 1984 book because we're seeing it just it came 40 years later. There's also a lot of information on the World Wide Web about tracking individuals with computer chips, especially, and actually, I just came back from lunch. I went to a local restaurant, which will remain unnamed. Actually, it's not no, local. It's all over the Midwest. For all I know, they might be nationwide. And I went to sit down or get a, a table, and they asked me my name. And I gave them my last name. And then they asked me my telephone number. And I said, why? Well, for COVID tracking, or whatever the term is for tracking that they're doing now. And I said, uh, that's a violation of my First Amendment. Now, <laughs> I know that my Google phone, because I have tracking turned on, because I want my wife and other members to find me. And if I lose my phone, I want to be able to locate it, turn, wipe it, and then turn it off or lock it. But people, I've been hearing things about the mark of the beast forever. And I want to set the record straight and explain it within the context in which it was written to the audience to which it was written to. So I'm, I titled this, The Mark of the Beast Explained Primarily to Christians. You see, Christians, including 99% of Christian teachers and pastors, have been taught that the mark of the beast will be a precursor to the Great Tribulation. And while this is true, according to Matthew 24, 15, which reads, so when you see the abomination of the desolation which was spoken of, to Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. This is the tree of life version. So, however, this presents a problem to many believers, as they are, as you know, or I should say there are, as you know, four different opinions or ways to look at the Great Tribulation. There are those who are pre-tribus, like myself, in which case there's no reason to be concerned as, well, we're not going to be on earth when that happens. Now, of course, the same would be true for those who believe in the mid-tribulation, those believers, I mean, and for those post-trib believers and for the amillennialists, uh, millennialists, I always have trouble getting that out. Perhaps they should be, be paying attention. In order to properly understand what the mark of the beast is all about, one must first understand that the Bible is a Jewish book. Jesus, Yeshua, his Hebrew name, and all the Bible authors were Jewish. There's some arguments about Luke because he's the only Bible writer that doesn't identify himself as being Jewish. And while Saul Paul, a Jewish Pharisee, was the apostle to the Gentiles, he always went, with one exception, to the synagogues first, meaning that there were always Jews, even in his churches that he planted. John, who wrote the prophecy of the book of Revelation, approached everything from a first century Jewish perspective. And while many non-Jewish 
meaning Christians and pagans, will accept the mark of the beast, it will be presented to the Jewish leaders of that day, whenever that day will be. And they will have to be accepted, or he will have to be accepted, by the said leaders. And then, accepted by others. We read in the Revelation 13, 16, And he causeth all, both animal, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive the mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. This is the King of James Version. This verse explicitly states that the mark would be on the right hand and on the forehead. This is referring to Exodus 13.9 and 13.16. It is also written in Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 8, and 11.18. So let's look at these scriptures and then put them into context so that you understand where John is getting the material that he is writing about in the book of Revelation. Chapter 13. Here we read in Exodus 13, 9. I'm going to use the International Standard Version for this one. It is to be a sign for you on your hand and a reminder on your forehead so that you may speak about the instruction of the Lord for the Lord brought you out of Egypt with a strong show of force. Exodus 13, 16 reads, it is to be a sign for you on your hand and a reminder on your forehead so that you may speak about the instructions of the Lord for the Lord brought you out of Egypt with a strong show of force. Exactly the same, slight difference. Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 8. I'm going to use the Tree of Life version for this. It said, let these words that I am commanding to you today be always on your heart. Teach them repeatedly to your children. Talk about them while sitting in your house or walking on the road. And as you lie down or get up, tie them as reminders on your forearm. That's your arm. Bind them on your forehead. Deuteronomy 11.8, Tree of Life Version also says, Therefore, you are to set these words on of mine in your heart and in your soul you are to bind them as a sign on your hand and as the frontlets between your eyes frontlets between your eyes means your forehead these are all old testament scriptures tanakh in hebrew let's look at these scriptures one more time in context starting with Exodus 13, 9 and 16. These two scriptures are presented in Exodus as part of the celebration of the Lord's Feast of Unleavened Bread as they were about to enter the land promised to their forefathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're my forefathers also. I'm a Jewish believer. This is the seven-day feast of the Lord following the one-day feast of Passover. This is the, the event described in Joshua chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, as I have taught concerning the Lord's feast of first fruits, Moed HaBikurim in Hebrew, which can be found on my YouTube channel, Rose of Sharon, Sharon comma, MN. Let's, let's let first look at the scriptures from Joshua 5. Chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. I'm going to use the Jewish Publication Society of 1917 because it is the most accurate translation from the Masoretic Hebrew text into late 18th and early 19th century English. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal, and they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the palms of Jericho. And they did eat of the produce of the land on the morrow, that was, means the day after Passover, on the morrow after Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the same self-same day. 
And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the produce of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna anymore, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Now let's look at Exodus 13, verses 3 through 16, the same version, Jewish Provocation Society of 1917. We'll put it in context. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which ye came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out from this place. There shall no leaven be eaten. This day ye go forth in the month of Abib. Just for clarity, Abib means barley. It's the month of barley. It's also in scripture in, in the month of Nisan. It's the same month. And if and, and it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Hivite and the Jebusite, which he swore unto thy fathers to give thee a land flowing with milk and honey, that thou shalt keep this service in this month. Seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten throughout the seven days, and there shall no leaven bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy borders. And thou shalt tell thy son in that day, saying, It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came forth out of Egypt. Now you can find a lot more detailed discussion about this in my books, Jesus in the Passover Celebration, More Than a Haggadah. It's available in a messianic genre, and it's also available in Spanish, and they can all be obtained on Amazon if you want to go a little deeper into what I just read, at least that part of Scripture. And then the next Scripture says, And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thy hand for a memorial between thine eyes, that the law of the Lord may be in thy mouth, for with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. Egypt. Thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in its season from year to year, and it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanite, as he swore unto thee and thy fathers, or and shall give it thee, that thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the womb, every firstling that is male, which thou hast coming of a beast, shall be of the Lord's. And every firstling of an ass, and thou shalt redeem with a lamb, and if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break its neck, and all its firstborn, and man among thy son shall thou redeem. And it shall be, when thy son asketh thee in the time to come, saying, What is this? What th that, thou, that thou shalt say unto him, by strength of hand, the Lord brought us out from the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, the Lord slew all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both the first land of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I, sacri I, sac I sacrifice to the Lord all that openeth the womb, being males, but all the firstborn of thy sons I redeem. Again, I covered this in great detail in Yeshua or and Jesus in the Passover Seder more than a, uh, or celebration more than a Haggadah. So, so you're welcome to get my books and go into great detail, but that's not the subject of this message. The only reason I'm reading this to you right now is because the mark of the beast from a cultural perspective is going to be replacing that which is done in custom customarily and in cu culture to remember our exodus from the land of Egypt under God's strong hand. And it says, and it continues, and this is where you see where we get in context the phrase, that the, the scripture I read earlier, and it shall be for a sign upon thy hand and the frontlets between thy eyes, for, for by strength of hand the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. So it's a commemoration. This sign that, that John is writing about in Revelation is going to be replacing this sign, which is a remembrance of our exodus from Egypt and from the bondage and slavery in, in Egypt. 
So now let's look at Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 8, and Deuteronomy 11, 8, in context. Once again, the scripture is written in the context of the Israelites going in to possess the land which the Lord has given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which we just covered in, uh, in uh, Joshua chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. So here it is, Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 through 19. I'm using the Tree of Life version here. It's a little easier on my tongue and probably a little easier to understand because I don't stumble as much. Now, this is the commandment, the statutes and ordinances that Adonai, your God, commanded to teach you to do in the land you are crossing over to possess so that you might fear Adonai. Adonai is God, one of God's names. It just stands for Lord, uh, Lord God. Adonai, your God, to keep all his statutes and mitzvot, which means commandments, that's Hebrew for commandments, that I am commanding you and your sons and your sons' sons all the days of your life, and so that you may prolong your days. We follow God's commandments, we have long life. Hear therefore, O Israel, and take care to do this, so that it may go well with you, and your many in increase mightily, as Adonai, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land. Love Adonai, your God, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all of your strength. Wait a minute, does that sound familiar? Yes, it's the, God, it's the Lord's greatest commandment as presented by Yeshua, by Jesus. It comes right from this, verse, from this verse here in Deuteronomy 6. These words which I am commanding you today are to be on your heart. We keep talking about heart and head, which means mind. You are to teach them diligently to your children and speak of them when you sit in your house when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Bind them as a sign on your hand. They are to be the frontlets between your eyes, that's your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is referring to the mezuzah, found on the front door of every single Jew Jewish home, which contains some of these scriptures, not all of them, and is always pointed toward Jerusalem. If you go to my front door, I'm not going to do it right now, you will find a mezuzah, a mezuzah. Now I'm going to take it with us when we move. We're going to be moving out of here, this house in just a little more than two weeks. Now, when Adonai your God, I'll continue, brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give you great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of good things that you did not fill, and cisterns dug that you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant and you eat and are full then watch yourself so that you do not forget Adonai who brought you out from the land of Egypt from the house of slavery you must w fear Adonai your God in this case fear means reverence and serve him and swear by his name you must not go after other gods the gods that the peoples around you for Adonai, your God, is in the midst of you and is a jealous God. Otherwise, the anger of Adonai, your God, remember, Adonai is Lord, Lord your God, will be kindled against you, and he will wipe you from the face of the earth. You are not to test Adonai, your God, as you tested him at Massa. Now, this is referring to Exodus verse, uh, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. Now, I cannot believe the number of times I have heard pastors say that the Lord was angry with Moses because he struck the rock against the Lord's instructions, and that's why Moses was not allowed to cross into the promised land. Haven't they read the scripture? Is that what they are teaching in Bible schools? Because scripture clearly tells Moses to strike the rock. So that obviously cannot be why Moses was not allowed to enter the, the promised land. So if you've been taught that, I'm correcting that you right now, although it doesn't have anything to do with the rest of this message. Continuing, diligently keep these mitzvot. Remember, mitzvot is commandments, not law, and uh, of Adonai, your God, and his testimonies and his statutes that he has commanded you. You are to do what is right and good in the sight of Adonai so that it might go well with you and you 
may go in and possess the good land that Adonai swore to your fathers to drive out all your enemies from before you as Adonai has spoken. So what I'm telling you here is the mark of the beast, which we're getting to, is tied to a remembrance of the bondage or the exodus from the bondage in, uh, in, of slavery in Egypt. Let's read Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 through 32, so we can put this in context. Also the Tree of Life version. Therefore you are to love Adonai your God, and keep his charge, his statutes, his ordinance, his mitzvot, at all times. And you should know this day that it was not your children who knew or saw the, 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 the discipline of Adonai your God, his greatness, his mighty hand, and his outstretched arm. Again, this comes from... Uh, or you'll find more of this in my book, uh, Jesus in the Passover celebration, more than, than a Haggadah. So again, it's on it's on Amazon and it's in three genres and it's in Spanish. Continuing, his signs and his deeds he did in the midst of Egypt to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to all of his land, and what he did to the army of Egypt, to the horses, to the chariots, when he made the waters of the Sea of the Reds, that's the Red Sea, flow over them as they chased after you and how Adonai has destroyed them to this day. What he did for you in the wilderness until you came into this place and what he did at, uh, to Dathan and uh, Eberon, sons of Eliab and Reuben, how the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up along with their households and tents and every living thing that followed them in the midst of all Israel. Rather, it is your, your own eyes that have seen every mighty deed that Adonai has done. The Lord has done. Therefore, you are to keep the whole mitzvah. Remember, mitzvah is uh, commandments. You are to keep the whole mitzvah that I am commanding you today so that you may be strong and go in and possess the land that you are crossing over, possess, and so that you may prolong your days on the land that Adonai swore to give to your fathers, to their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land you're going in to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you came, where there you planted your seed and watered it by foot like a vegetable garden, but the land you are crossing over to possess is a land of hills and valleys, drinking from rain of the heavens it drinks in water. It is a land that Adonai your God cares for. The eyes of Adonai your God are always on it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Now, if you listen obediently to my mitzvot that I am commanding you today to love Adonai your God, and to serve him with all of your heart and soul, there we go, the greatest commandment, then I will give rain for the land that is in its season, the early rain and the late rain, so that you may gather in your grain new wine and olive oil. I will give grass in your field for your livestock, and you will eat and be satisfied. Watch yourself so that your heart is not deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then the anger of Adonai will be kindled against you, so he will shut up the sky so that there is no rain, and the soil will not yield its produce. Then you will perish quickly from the good land Adonai has given you. And the land was desolate for nearly 2,000 years until 1948, when Israel was turned into a, a garden again. And then the next verse, here we go again. Therefore you are to set these words on your mind. That's the same thing as putting it on your forehead. And in your heart, same thing as putting it on your left arm. You are to bind them as a sign on your hand and the frontlets between your eyes. You are to teach them to the children, speaking of them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You are to write them on the doorposts of your house. Again, we're talking about the mezuzah. And on your gates, so that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied on the land Adonai swore to give to your fathers as long 
as the heaven are above the earth. For if you will diligently keep all of the mitzvah that I am commanding you to do, to love Adonai your God, to walk in all his ways and cling to him, then Adonai will drive out all these nations from you and will dispossess nations greater and mightier than yourselves. Every place where the sole of your foot treads will be yours, from the wilderness to Lebanon, from the river to the river Euphrates, as far as the Western Sea, that's the Mediterranean Sea, will be your borders. No one will be able to stand against you. Adonai, your God, will put the fear of dread of you upon all the land where you tread, just as he has promised. See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you listen to the mitzvot of Adonai, your God, that I am commanding you today, but the curse if you do not listen to the mitzvot of Adonai your God, but turn from the way I am commanding. Now when Adonai your God brings you into the land you are going to possess, you are to set a blessing on Mount Gerizim and curse on Mount Ebal. And they, are they not across the Jordan toward the west in the land of the Canaanites who dwell in Arabah, opposite Galgal, beside the oaks of Mora, For you are about to cross over the Jordan to go in and possess the land Adonai your God is giving you. You will possess it and dwell in it, and you will take care to do all the statutes and ordinance that I am setting before you today. So you see, we're talking about putting something on the arm and on the forehead. And it's a commemoration as the ancient Israelites, my ancestors, are entering in the land, into the land of milk and honey, defeating all the Canaanites, all the ites, let's just put it that way, in the land of Canaan. Now, I do have another teaching on why God told Joshua to wipe out all the inhabitants of the land. It actually goes back to Genesis chapter 6 but I'm not going to cover that today. So, everything that I have just read, or you have read with me, in whatever version of the Bible you possess, has resulted in a custom followed by every Jewish Orthodox male, and was followed by Yeshua, Jesus, and all of his disciples, putting on what's called tefillin, or phylactery, during the morning prayer, as a reminder to remember to follow well, I don't see my face here, so I'm hoping that I'm still broadcasting because I don't see you. Looks like we're having problems with the video and I wasn't paying much attention. So I'm hoping that I'm recording. If I'm not, maybe it's just not playing on my end. But these are the tefillin, the phylactery. I've had these for 60 years. I don't know where my talit is. Uh, it's probably packaged and moving. This is my father's talit, and this one is 82 years old. At any rate, send me a message or, uh, or write a comment if you're still seeing me. If not, I'm going to start over again because somewhere or other I lost something. At any rate, this is the tefillin. It is put on oh, inside of this, and I'll talk about that in a little, a little while while you put one of these on your arm and it is the left arm that you put it on because the left arm is closest to your to your heart and so let me get this a little tighter if I can so you put it on the inside of your arm closest to your heart and And then you make the, the letter Shin and the letter, letter Dalit. Shin is, uh, is for Shaddai, that is God's, one of God's names. And so we put this, we make the letter Shin. I don't know if I'm, I can't see my video, so I don't know if, you can, if, it's, if it's showing. I see my camera is still on. 
and then we need to be equally spaced, and then we make the letter dal, uh, the dal, letter dalit. We wrap it seven times. I'm stuck in my seat seats. I'm stuck. We got three, and we got four. And then we bring it into the hand. There we go. Four times around there. And we don't wrap it around the center finger until we get the one on our forehead on first. And then we put the one on our forehead. When we read about the mark of the beast, we are referencing or referring to the tefillin on the heart, on the forehead, and on the left arm. I'm missing a strap. Oh, there it is. Say hi, if you're still seeing me. So everything I've just read, or if you read with me, in whatever version of the Bible, has been practiced by Orthodox Jewish men for thousands of years. Putting on the tefillin or the phylactery during the morning prayer as a reminder to remember to follow and adhere to God's instructions and commemorate what God has done for our ancestors, my ancestors, and he will do for us. We're talking about Jewish people. We're putting it into context now, cultural context. In the future, as we honor him and follow his commandments, you will notice that within these scriptures is what is known as, or is known to Christians, as the single greatest commandment found in Matthew 22, 38, and Mark 12, verses 28 through 30, as I've mentioned before. This practice, as I said, goes back thousands of years. The Apostle John, who wrote down the revelation of Yeshua, Jesus, as we read in Revelation uh, 1, verses 1 and 2, it says, This is the revelation of Jesus the Messiah, which God gave him to show his servants and the things that must happen soon. He made it known by sending his messenger, his messenger to the servant John, who testified about this message from God and the testimony about Jesus the Messiah. Now John also wrote down at the part of the revelation pertaining to the mark of the beast, as we read in chapter 13, verse 16, which reads as follows. This is the ISV version. The second beast forces all people, important and unimportant, rich and poor, free and slaves, to be marked on their right hand or on their forehead. As Yeshua, Jesus, and all his disciples were Jewish, and the scriptures at that time were from the Tanakh, the Old Testament, as there was no New Testament at that time, everything we read must be interpreted from within that culture. If it is to be accepted by Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin in the future, it must be something familiar to Judaic customs and practices. In the Hebrew culture, such a practice is mentioned, as mentioned before, has been adhered to for thousands of years, the putting on of tefillin, tefillin, the phylactery. This is a daily practice among Orthodox Jews. Every Orthodox Jew during morning service puts on the tefillin, the phylactery, on their forehead, between their eyes, and on their left arm. This is a practice today in Israel where the Antichrist will appear before the world. If one was to go to the Western world, world excuse me, the Western Wall, the holiest site in the world for Jews during the time of morning prayer, and quite frankly, at other times of the day, as people go to the Western Wall, wall all hours of the day to pray, you will see people put wearing and putting on to Finland, or vice versa, putting on and wearing. Why on the left arm rather than on the right arm? The left arm is closest to the heart than the right. However, if one follows the instructions recorded in the Talmud, which is what Judaism actually does follow, 
that's a topic for another day. There's an exception. There are a lot of exceptions you find in, in, uh, in uh, the Talmud. If you're left-handed, you know, you then put the tefillin on your right hand, probably because you can't handle it, you can't wrap it properly. The tefillin contains scripture from Exodus 13, 1 through 10 and 11, 16, and Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9, and 11, verses 12 through 21, quoted above. In other words, placing God's word between your eyes, your mind, and on your left arm, closest to your heart, as a sign of remembrance of the Lord bringing the Israelites, my ancestors, out of bondage from Egypt. And the tefillin itself is a reminder of how uh, to follow God's instructions, God's Torah, which includes what Yeshua, Jesus, quotes as the single greatest commandment. The adversary is a copycat. And what the Lord has instructed his people to do, therefore, he is a, well, not so perfect copycat. He copies the Lord's instructions with a slight alteration, just as he did with Eve in the garden. He will instruct us to put his mark on the forehead, but on the right arm instead of on the left. The mark of the beast is intended for Orthodox Jews who will be left behind after the rapture by replacing the phylactery, the tefillin, with something else. Perhaps it's going to be a computer chip. Perhaps it will have a manifesto, his manifesto, recorded in it. We don't know. Since believers, that's Christians, have been grafted into the olive tree, that's found in Romans 11, many of them will also be deceived and put on the mark. When you take the scripture out of context and out of its cultural framework, the scripture in Revelation 13, 16 is left up, left up to the receiver to, or to the reader to interpret through one's modern cultural understanding, lacking the cultural context of the century in which the scripture was, was written. This is exactly what the founding fathers of Christianity did without the understanding and guidance from the leaders of the ecclesia in Jerusalem who they banned from any and all ecumenical councils in order for Jews to accept the Antichrist. He, the Antichrist, must present himself as a Jew. He must be acceptable to the orthodoxy, the Sanhedrin, just as Rabbi Simon Bar Kokhba was in the early second century and was endorsed by Rabbi Akiva. Because of the endorsement by the leaders of his time, in ancient Israel, Rabbi Bar Kuchba was recognized as Messiah, the conquering king, and was able to assemble a large army of well over a million soldiers. The Antichrist must also be a person of equal or greater recognition to the future rabbinic leaders in Israel. However, the prophecy in Matthew 23, verses 37 through 39, must be fulfilled first before the Antichrist can appear. In other words, there have to be enough Jews in Jerusalem to accept them, to accept Jesus, that is. When Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 was fulfilled at Yeshua's, Jesus' Passover meal, at which he was betrayed, there was no need to replace the word of God on one's forehead and left arm for Jewish believers, and there was never a need for Gentiles meaning Christians and other groups, as the tefillin was never intended for them in the first place. Revelation 13, 16 and the surrounding verses were specifically referred, referring to the Jews in Jerusalem where the third temple, actually that's the fourth temple, because Zerubbabel's temple was the second, Herod's was the third, and this would be the fourth, where the, third, where the fourth temple will be built and the Antichrist will receive them. The Israelis who are left behind, I hope this helps you and anyone else who didn't understand the scripture in Jan Daniel 9, verses 24 through 26, or Revelation 13, 16. I realize that there are going to be many people, Christians, that have not been taught properly, uh, that have actually been taught incorrectly, or and, and I know I'm going to get a lot of feedback, but this is how you interpret the scripture about in Revelation 13, 16. With that, I leave you with the Aaronic blessing from Numbers.
chapter 6, verses 24, 25, and 26. Yeverechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha, ye'er Adonai panavalecha v'hunecha, yesar, yesar Adonai panavalecha v'yasem lecha shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Shalom. We'll see you again when I relocate, when we relocate the family in uh, Kansas, or it might be Missouri. We're having trouble finding housing in, in Kansas. And to, at, that, at that, I'm going to say shalom again. And uh, Lala Tov, and a good night. I'm going to end this video. I'm going to see if it's recorded all the way. And if not, I'll do it again. <laughs>